Amen. Thank you, Dr. Tony, and our choir, and our praise team, our instrumentalists, the folks on the camera, and even the folks up in the sound room. Appreciate all the good work you do in helping our worship service to flow smoothly, and it also prepares my heart for what I'm getting ready to do, which is preach. So certainly thankful. I was sit sitting in the be finding of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and while you're finding that, and thinking about the title of the text or the title of the message today, Our Blessed Hope, that time when Jesus returns for his church. I was sitting in the interim pastor study uh, this morning and I could hear the trumpet playing and I'm like, how appropriate that we would have a trumpet uh, for uh, today as we think about our blessed hope, the fact that Jesus is coming back for us one day soon, perhaps today. And the fact that the text we're going to look at this morning speaks of a trumpet that will sound uh, when that happens. So uh, this is a subject that I feel really passionate about. I don't believe the church uh, preaches on this subject enough. Uh, it, it, it just amazes me that you can have basically one-third of the Bible that deals with Jesus and his future return, establishing his kingdom when he comes again. And the church, for the most part, and I'm speaking of the church worldwide, for the most part will ignore one-third of the Bible. It just amazes me. And growing up, and I think I've shared this before, growing up, I heard zero messages about the second coming, about the return of Christ for his church when I was growing up. So I don't want to be that kind of preacher. I want to be one who from time to time reminds the body of Christ that Jesus is coming again. Now, I had an aunt, she's now with Jesus, so she's gotten all this straightened out, and she and I used to talk about this, but she would say, well, don't be so heavenly minded that you are of no earthly good. Now listen, I've met a lot of people that were so earthly minded, they were no heavenly good, but I have yet to meet anyone who was so heavenly minded that they weren't any earthly good. I think I knew what she meant, but at the same time, Again, I, I haven't met anybody who I would say they're, they're just so heavenly minded that they are not any earthly good. Those I, those I meet who have set their minds on things above, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, they are of earthly good. They're about their father's business. So anyway, this morning our text is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we will be thinking about our blessed hope as believers, that moment when Jesus returns for his church, and it's been called any number of things. Some people call it the rapture of the church, but some people aren't comfortable uh, with that word. And so if you're not comfortable with that word, let's just think about the Greek word itself, which is harpazo, which means to snatch away suddenly. So if you're not comfortable with rapture, let's just call it the great snatch. You know, Jesus is coming back and he's going to snatch us away suddenly and without warning. It means to seize or to carry off by force and to do it suddenly. So think about that, the return of Christ for his church. No time to get ready because when he comes, it, it will be sudden. It, he will snatch us away by force. He will seize us away as the body of Christ, as his bride, take us back to the Father's house. Uh, we'll have that great uh, time with Christ where we'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll uh, stand before the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ, and he will re reward us for our service to him here on this earth and you know, many more things that are going to happen that we just don't have time to talk about this morning uh, because we are under a time crunch this morning. But to think about this idea of, of being snatched away or carried away by force, the Bible mentions seven occasions uh, where he either uses the word harpazo or he describes uh, the event that is taking place in terms of, of this idea of being snatched away or taken away suddenly. And so back in the Old Testament, we have both Enoch and Elijah, neither one of them tasted death, but God took them uh, in their bodies into heaven. And we have over in the New Testament, Philip, of course, in the book of Acts, and then we have Paul and his, his experience of being caught up into the third heaven. We have the Apostle John, who had a similar experience. Uh, then in the text we're going to look at this morning, the church we see will be caught up together. And then over in the book of Revelation, uh, we see the two witnesses are caught up uh, there at the midpoint of the tribulation period, or Daniel's 70th week. And I wish we had time to get into all that this morning, 
uh, but we don't. But we do need to understand three things as we think about our blessed hope. And number one, and normally I would give this, uh, these three, this lesson in three different sermons, and I would start in John, but uh, I'm starting with sermon number three today, so maybe we'll work backwards. I don't know. Well, I'll pray about that. But in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, we have the promise of Jesus himself that he is going to come back and get us at some future time. You recall the, the story there is that he says, in my father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And so he gives us the promise of his return there in John chapter 14. But then over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58, he gives us the purpose behind all of that. And that, of course, is the resurrection chapter where he describes for us the, resurrect, the future resurrection of believers and the fact that not everyone will taste death. But those believers who are alive at that moment when Jesus returns, dead believers will be resurrected, living believers will be changed or transformed into their glorified bodies, and together uh, God will take us on into glory. But then he gives us here in the text we're looking at today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the process, that is, how is all of this going to happen or unfold when this moment comes? So today we're going to look at the process, and so let's look together at our text 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. And if you're able, I would invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's Word as we think about our blessed hope as believers. <clears throat> Notice verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do, as do the rest who have no hope. Now, some translations say we do not want you to be ignorant the Greek word there means ignorant, and so the idea there is that he doesn't want you to be ignorant about these things. He wants us to be informed about them so that we do not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Father, thank you for these words. Thank you, Father, that you have given them to us so that we may comfort one another with them, especially uh, during times of great trial on this earth or when we have suffered loss, when loved ones have gone on before us. Father, you want us to be comforted during those times and knowing that death for the believer is not the end, but one of these days Jesus is coming for all of us, and when he comes, he'll bring those who've gone on before. So be with us now as we unpack this text. May you add your blessings to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of your word today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Be, you may be seated. And as we work through the text this morning, we're thinking about our blessed hope as believers and the promise that Jesus has made to us that he is going to return one of these days for his bride, the church. And we as believers, we're all a part of the body of Christ. We're all a part of the bride of Christ. And one of these days, Jesus is coming back for his bride. And the Bible makes it very clear that that return, that future return of Jesus for his bride could happen at any moment. At any moment, Jesus could descend from heaven and call us home to be with him in glory. At any moment that could happen. So it could happen in the next few moments. It could happen before the sermon is over today. After we dismiss and head down to the square, it could happen before you get down to the square. I mean, just at any moment, Jesus could return for his bride. And so we have here in this text several descriptive words about the promises that Jesus has made for us and is making for us in this text, the idea that He's coming back for us. There's going to be that great snatch. He's going to seize us away by force and take us to be with him. And we see, first of all, in verse 13, that it is a clear 
promise. It is a clear promise. Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed. We do not want you to be ignorant about these things. And so what he's saying here is that, that he, is, he has made the mystery of God in this regard clear for us. And back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, he speaks of this idea of resurrection in terms of a mystery. But he says in verse 51 of, Isaac, of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, that is, we will not all die, but we will all be changed. And so Paul is saying to us over here in 1 Corinthians, Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 that the promise of God in this regard is clear that he has he has unpacked this for us in his word uh, as we think about this idea of blessed hope it is a clear promise there was confusion in the Thessalonian church they didn't quite understand this someone had given them some bad information and they believed that their dead loved ones who had died in Christ had somehow missed out on this future return of Jesus and Paul is writing to say no that's not the case at all in fact when God does return when Jesus does descend from heaven the dead in Christ are going to rise first so they haven't missed out on this so Paul is saying this is a this is a clear promise of God to you and me as believers in fact over in 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 5 Paul writes do you not remember that while I was still with you I was telling you these things so Paul is directing their attention back to what he had already taught them he did not want them to be uninformed uh, it's another way of saying this is not rocket science Jesus is coming again for his church for his bride it was a mystery in the Old Testament and, and that, I mean, there was no mention of the church anywhere in the Old Testament. Although there was some allusions to the resurrection, there was really no clear teaching about the resurrection like we find in the New Testament. And so we get over into the New Testament now, and Paul, God through the Apostle Paul, has made the mystery clear. Jesus is coming again for his church. He's coming for his bride. There will be a resurrection. The dead in Christ will be raised first. We'll all be joined together. We'll all be caught up together. So it is a clear promise, but not only that, we see in verse 14 that it is a conditional promise. Notice the word if, he says in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now some Greek scholars tell us this word can be translated since, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And, and I would agree with that translation, but I really like the word if because it helps us understand that this is really a conditional promise. And by that, I mean it, it demonstrates the conditionality of who will be participating in this moment, momentous event. In other words, only those who belong to Jesus. Notice again what he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So only those who have believed the gospel will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So it is a conditional promise that is we must believe that Jesus died and rose again so he makes it very simple he's basically describing the gospel here we must believe the gospel notice again verse 14 if we believe that Jesus died and rose again now look you can sit down with any number of pastors and probably get a little bit different viewpoint on this passage I remember uh, when I was serving as an Air Force chaplain, there was about four of us sitting around the table at lunch one day, and we were discussing future things. That is, the idea that one of these days, God is going to wrap everything up, and four people sitting around that table, four different viewpoints. Of course, I had the correct viewpoint, so I was trying to help them uh, understand why they needed to come over to my way of thinking. But at the end of the day, we all agreed that all that really mattered was that we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Aren't you glad that Paul didn't write, for if we believe exactly like this when it comes to future things, then we will be able to participate in this event. No, he just cuts to the chase. He says, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again. So it is conditioned then upon your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. You placed your faith and your trust in Jesus. We must believe the gospel. God, and notice what he says here, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So the idea of sleep here for the believer is not soul sleep, 
but what he's describing here is death, that the believer has died in Christ, their soul has gone to be with Christ, and one of these days when Jesus comes back, the Bible says here in verse 14 that, that God will bring with him, the only way you can bring someone with you is they have to be where? With you. And so they're with Jesus now, so when Jesus comes, he's bringing our loved ones who are dead in Christ or asleep in Jesus, he's bringing them with him at that point. And so, it, it, again, it's all conditioned upon our belief in the gospel. If our, if our faith rests in Christ, whether we're alive or dead at this moment, we will all participate. That's Paul's point here. So it is a conditional promise. It's a clear promise, but it's also a certain promise. Notice verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Now, all of this is the word of the Lord, but sometimes to make a point even clearer or more certain, the writers of the New Testament and Old Testament, that matter, would use phrases like, thus says the Lord. But here Paul is saying, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So Paul, is, Paul wants us to understand that, that this is a certain promise because it is based upon the word of God, what God had revealed to the Apostle Paul. So it is a certain promise. And this process is certain, he says. And notice again in verse 15, it's by the word of the Lord. So God is not a liar. It was promised at the Last Supper in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Paul, God used Paul to reveal the purpose of our blessed hope. Oh, back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58, we've already alluded to that. But he gives us the process here. And he reminds us that it could happen at any moment. It is certain because we have God's word on it. So sometimes people say, well, I don't believe in the rapture. And I always say to that, so you don't believe in the resurrection? Oh, no, I believe in the resurrection. I just don't believe in the rapture. Well, the rapture is just another word for the resurrection. So maybe you do believe in the rapture. It's just a matter of timing. You know, when do all these things take place? So it is a certain promise. Believers will one day be resurrected. Believers who are alive at that moment will be changed. They'll be transformed. It is a certain promise. And notice how Paul pulls all of this together. He says in verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So those who are dead in Christ, they're getting a head start. Maybe that's because they're six feet under, so they've got a little bit further to travel than the rest of us who are alive at this moment. Regardless, the Bible says that the dead in Christ will be raised first, then those of us who are alive and remain will be changed. And if you look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says that that change will take place in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, so faster than I can snap my fingers, it's all over. That's why you got to be ready now. That's why your faith must rest in Jesus now, because when that moment comes, it'll be over before we even realize what's happened. Think about that. So, it is, it is a certain promise because it is based upon the word of the Lord. But not only that, it is a what I like to call a counterintuitive promise. That is, it, it goes against everything that, that, that we would think would be normal. I mean, this seems outside the norm. In fact, this is Christianity's most preposterous promise. This whole idea that a Savior is coming from the sky to rescue, to call home, his church that is dead dead believers will be raised those living at that moment will be changed i mean all of that sounds preposterous and when you talk about this with unbelievers it really sounds preposterous or counterintuitive dead people don't come back to life i mean that's counterintuitive but this is again this is christianity's most preposterous belief even more preposterous than the idea that jesus himself rose again no other religion teaches this or anything remotely similar to this I mean come on do you really believe that this Jesus is going to one day return for a group of people that describe themselves as the body of Christ and the bride of Christ and that dead people are going to be raised and people who are living are going to be changed and all of this is going to happen so quickly you, 
more quickly than you can snap your fingers. I mean, do you really believe this? Absolutely. Why? Because God's Word describes it. We have God's Word on this. And notice how Paul pulls all this together. Now, remember, we have the promise of his return back in John chapter 14. We have the promise of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But notice here uh, what's going on. He says in verse uh, 16, for the Lord himself. So Jesus is coming. He's not sending an angel. He's not sending some religious representative. He's coming himself. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Now notice what's happening during this descent. The idea is that, that this is all happening simult simultaneously. Notice what he says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Now notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that the Lord is coming all the way to the earth. Over in the Old Testament we see that that when the Messiah returns that second time, his feet will literally touch the ground at the Mount of Olives there in Jerusalem. And we see that over in Revelation as well. But in this instant, his feet aren't touching the ground. Notice what's happening. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. So there's going to be a shout. I'm not real sure what he's going to shout. Maybe he's going to shout to those dead believers, come forth. Maybe he's going to shout to all of us, be changed, whatever. He's, there's going to be a shout. He's descending from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Not sure what the archangel is going to uh, say, but I heard one scholar one time remind his readers that Satan was the prince of the power of the air, so maybe the archangel is going to shout, give way and make way for the people of God. So there'll be a shout. And then he says that there will be a trumpet with the trumpet of God. We heard a trumpet this morning. So think about that trumpet on steroids, you know, really blowing <laughs> loudly, a loud proclamation of a trumpet blast, and all of this happening together. Jesus descends from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and notice what happens next. The dead in Christ will rise first. You know, imagine what it would be like to be at a funeral and, of course, there would be believers and unbelievers at the funeral. And all of a sudden, the body there in the casket is gone. And others in the congregation are gone. And then there are those who are left behind, and they're trying to figure out what happened. The dead in Christ will rise first. Notice what he says. Then, verse 17, then, so the dead in Christ rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. We're being caught up. So remember, Jesus is descending, but his feet are not touching the Mount of Olives. Notice where we're being caught up to. We're being caught up together with them in the clouds. Now, I don't think he means clouds like we might see on any given day. I think what he means here is glory clouds, those, those clouds of glory that received or covered Jesus as he ascended into heaven back in Acts uh, chapter 1. So he ascends into heaven, and the Bible says the clouds basically received him out of their sight. So the idea of glory clouds here. So I guess only believers will see these clouds. He says, then those of us who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. Not on the Mount of Olives, but in the air. We're meeting Jesus in the air. And then he says, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So we have the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the promise of the resurrection being fulfilled at this moment, the resurrection of, of church-age believers, the dead in Christ arising fir first, the promise of removal. We're being removed from this planet, the promise of reunion. Uh, we're meeting together in the air with all those who've gone on before, and I don't know at what point we see Jesus, and I want to see him pretty much right away, but you almost get the idea that there's a reunion taking place there in the clouds with those who've gone on before. I don't know exactly how all that's going to unfold. All I know is I want to be a part of it when it happens. And then we have the promise of rest. He says verse, in verse 17 that we're going to be with the Lord forever. And all of this will happen according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. How long is a moment 
and how long is the twinkling of an eye? I think I've alluded to this before, but someone said we blink our eyes about 20,000 times a day, if you can imagine. So I guess that's 20,000 opportunities for Jesus to come back. I'm not sure. But for someone's eye to twinkle, light must travel through the front of their eye, be reflected off their retina, and exit their eye. So that's, that's the twinkle. And that takes those who are smart enough to measure that kind of speed tell us that takes a nanosecond or one billionth of a second it is as far as time can be divided if you can imagine that if you can wrap your mind around that in other words there's no time to react that fast no time to react so these folks who say well i'll get right with jesus before i die well first of all you can drop dead any moment so get right with Jesus now. And second of all, Jesus could return at any moment and you won't have time to get right with Jesus. That's my point because of the, the, the swiftness with which this event will take place. And the world won't even know what happened. They'll just know that lots of people around this globe disappeared suddenly with, and without warning. That's a counterintuitive promise. That goes against the grain. But notice also he says that it is also, in verse 18, a comforting promise. He says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's why we do not grieve as the rest of the world who has no hope. When our loved ones who die in Christ die, we grieve, we sorrow, but it's not this unending, overwhelming, uncontrollable, unconsolable kind of grief. Why? Because we know that they've gone to be with Jesus. And we know that one of these days they're coming back with Jesus. And we know that one of these days, because we are all in Christ, we're going to see each other again. But we still grieve, but not as those who have no hope. Because Jesus is coming again. Death is not the end. For the Christian, it is only the beginning. And folks, Jesus is coming for his church I believe he's coming soon, a whole lot sooner than most folks are willing to even believe or entertain in their thinking. And the Bible says here that we are to comfort one another with these words. We're to comfort one another with these words. So, got about five minutes. So in conclusion, let me just share five reasons. Uh, some people call them signs that I believe that indicate that we are living very near the return of Christ for his church when his focus will shift from the church age back to the people of Israel, back to the Jewish people. Uh, one sign or one trend, if you don't like the word sign, is Jewish immigration to Israel. That is the Jews returning to Israel from all over the world. All you got to do is dig into the news just a little bit and you can find story after story after story of Jews returning to the Holy Land from all over the world just like the Bible predicted would happen in the time of the end. And then there's this whole idea of anticipation for peace in the Middle East. If you've been paying attention, they've been talking about two-state solutions, peace in the Middle East, different peace plans that they put forth and all these things, and no one can seem to work all that out, but there's coming a man on the scene at some future time who will seemingly work it all out. So the anticipation for peace the alignment of nations for the last days. The Bible gives us a very specific alignment of nations in the world, particularly in that part of the world, for the last days. And over the last several years, we have seen those nations shift and move, alliances made and, and all of that. And it just seems that everything is just moving in the direction that the Bible said it would move. I have a friend who's now with Jesus, but he used to say, of all the directions things could go in, isn't it amazing that they always seem to go in the direction predicted by the Bible. And then there are the arrangements for the third temple. If you were paying attention the past couple of weeks, you may have seen some news articles about a group of red heifers that were taken to Israel that they believe may be pure and undefiled red heifers and something that would be required when the Jews get ready to rebuild their temple. So I'm kind of keeping my eyes on that, and we'll see how that unfolds over the next several months. But this whole movement within Israel to rebuild their temple. And then there's what I like to call addiction or argument over Jerusalem. You know, the whole world wants to argue over Jerusalem. Who's going to own it? Who's going to control it? All those things. And three different religions claim some kind of allegiance to Jerusalem. And so there's all this argument over Jerusalem. But you know what? 
The Bible tells us it's God's city, and he's given it to the Jews. So there's no question in my mind about who owns the city of Jerusalem. But what, what I want you to see in all this is that we are close, a whole lot closer than most folks are willing to believe, to Jesus' return for his church. Again, it could happen at any moment. I mean, think about that. What a day that will be. I mean, think about the greatest day in your life. Well, whatever the greatest day in your life might be or might have been, it will pale in comparison to that day when Jesus descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ are raised and the rest of us who are alive at that moment were changed, were transformed, and were caught up into the clouds to be reunited with our loved ones who've gone on before and to be with Jesus. What a day that would be. So whatever the greatest day you can imagine in your own life that's already occurred, trust me, that'll just be a drop in the bucket when you see Jesus face to face. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Are you ready? I'm ready. But there's really only one way to get ready. Go back to verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So you've got to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be, God come in human flesh, that he lived the life that you could not live, that he died the death that you could never die. And through all of that, God somehow, some way, placed all of your sins on the Christ. And Christ paid that sin debt in full. And the Bible tells us he died, but three days later he was raised from the dead. And the Bible says if we believe that, God will save us if we believe that simple gospel message. And that's the only way you and I can get ready to be able to participate in this future event that's coming a whole lot sooner than most folks are willing to believe. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the wonderful promise that we have as believers that Jesus is coming again that he's coming for his bride, the church. He's coming for each one of us. And Father, we just pray that that day would be today. Lord, we just look forward to that moment when we see Jesus. And I pray that everyone in this congregation today, those watching by Facebook or listening on the radio or maybe even may listen later, Father, we just pray that everyone who has heard this message or will hear it will settle once and for all their readiness to see Jesus, that they will place their faith and their trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. And Father, your word promises that for those who belong to Jesus, when Jesus comes back, we're going to be with him. Thank you for these comforting words from your word, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.